The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining this uh, webinar. My name is Thomas Mueller. I'm the Director of Applications Development for the uh, AFM business at Bruker, and I'd like to welcome you to this installment of the Bruker AFM webinar series. The presentation today is titled AFM for Solar Fuels Research, Surface Imaging of Charge Transfer on Photocatalysts. This webinar today will be presented jointly by Professor Fang Tao Fan from the Chinese Academy of Sciences and by Dr. Teddy Huang from Bruker. Before I introduce the speakers, I'd like to make a few quick logistical comments. First, we encourage your participation during the webinar. If you have a question, please type it into the questions dialog box on your screen. We will accumulate these questions to the presentation, group them, and then answer them afterwards. Quite often, we have more questions than we can answer, and we will follow up uh, with email then. Also, if you'd like to review the presentation afterwards or pass it to a colleague, the uh, webinar will be posted online within a week um, um, of this webinar, and um, it'll be posted in the webinar section of the Bruker AFM webpage. As a follow-up to this presentation, you'll also receive an email with that link. Finally, when you exit the webinar software, you'll be asked to take a brief survey. We'd very much appreciate if you take the time to complete this, as it helps us pick the topics that are most important to you and generally make the series better. So, let me get started by first introducing our two presenters. Um, we're fortunate to be joined today by Professor Feng Tao Fan, who is the group leader in the Solar Energy Research Division and Vice Director of the State Key Laboratory of Catalysis at Dalian Institute of Chemical Physics, China Academy of Sciences, where he also received his PhD degree in physical chemistry in 2010. His research interests include inoperando spectroscopy, photoelectrical imaging spectroscopy, and development of a deep ocean UV Raman spectrograph. Also presenting today will be Dr. Teddy Huang, who is a staff application scientist at Bruker. He obtained his PhD in physical chemistry from Emory University in 2012 and did his postdoc work at Caltech. He joined Bruker in 2014 and now leads the development of AFM-based electrical and electrochemical applications. He has a strong academic record in solar fuels research with more than 40 peer-reviewed publications and 2,500 citations. So let me turn it over to our presenters. We'll start with Dr. Teddy Huang, who will say a few words about AFM for energy research, and he will then hand it over to Professor Fan. So Teddy, please take it from here. Okay, uh, thank you, Thomas, and thanks everyone for joining this webinar. I know a lot of audience is actually from Asia, and then it's really late at that time. I'm really appreciate that. Okay, today we are very happy to have Professor Fan Tao Fan to uh, have uh, co-present this webinar. And before uh, before the presentation from Professor Fan, I'm gonna give a, about 10 minutes introduction about this webinar series and some background about AFM for energy research, especially uh, focus on the solar fields. Okay. So, um, Bruker AFM units, I mean, the Bruker AFM based units, actually, we dedicate a lot of efforts uh, in the general energy research, including photovoltaic, battery, fuel cell, etc. And if you go to our Bruker uh, webinar homepage, you can find a whole bunch of webinar uh, about that. For example, at this here, uh, for webinar that related, especially focus on the lithium ion battery, and this is actually co presented. Uh, with Dr. Xin Chen Xiao and also uh, uh, Dr. Xin Chen Xiao from, uh, from GM and also um, students from uh, Professor uh, Brian Sheldon's group at Brown University. And for this uh, series, we are focused on another energy research area, which is solar fuels. Okay, and I'm going to give a very brief introduction about solar field research. But now, just let me show you uh, the list of this, uh, the list of webinar in this series. Of course, uh, back in July 21st, uh, we have Dr. Michael Nulis from Shannon Botcher's group in University of Oregon talking about uh, surface uh, in situ in operando surface electrochemical potential in, um, measurement using a nano electro 
electrical tip. And today we are going to uh, Professor Fine is going to talk about surface imaging of charge transfer on photocatalysis. And this upcoming one is about one month later in December six, and it's going to be presented by Dr. Francesca Thomer and Dr. Joanna Etchong <coughs> from uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And they are going to presenting their recent work published on nature communication about nanoscale charge transport in water splitting photoanodes. And of course, uh, in, in, in the first quarter of 2019, we're going to have a workshop, uh, a workshop at Caltech with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with Dr. Um, Bruce Brunchwick. And he will present some work that uh, we collaborate together in the past several years. So solar energy is actually a very attractive energy source for renewable energy. So um, the current world's energy consumption is about 18 terawatt, and it's estimated to be about 50 uh, terawatt. And the problem is that uh, on the Earth, there's no single source energy, but solar uh, can meet this demand. And, and if you look at the solar energy, it's actually when, when solar strikes the Earth, um, the, uh, the power is 120,000 terawatt. And, um, and if we have a net 10% efficient solar energy farm that covering only 0.16% of the land on Earth, it will, uh, it will supply 20 terawatts of power, of power globally. So this is a very attractive, uh, almost exhausted uh, energy uh, on the Earth that we should use. Of course, there's a lot of way to uh, harvest the solar energy and then uh, convert it to something that human being can use, like uh, solar electricity. And here today, we're going to talk about another method called solar fuel. So solar fuel, um, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a direct conversion of solar radiation into chemical substances. So now we capture the sunlight, we capture the solar energy, and then, uh, and then convert it and then start into chemical bond, like, like, a, like a hydrogen, right? And it's more attractive, right? Uh, we can also convert the hydrogen. Uh, we can also convert uh, convert sunlight and plus water plus carbon dioxide, and then to uh, turn them into liquid fuels like diesel or gasoline. Of course, no matter it's it's hydrogen or or, or some uh, carbon hydroxide uh, or some hydrocarbon, they are very attractive to uh, today's economy. Okay. And uh, a solar fuel generator is actually very complicated, um, and no matter it's on the nano scale or on the device level. So, because you can imagine that, right? We need something uh, to capture the light. Uh, and most of, uh, most of the time we use a, a semiconductor um, a light observer. And because either the hydrogen, either the pro, uh, proton uh, reduction to get a hydrogen or water oxidation to get um, uh, the, uh, the water oxidation process, both are multiple electron process, you need catalysis. And you want to separate the product because you don't want the product mixed together like hydrogen and oxygen mixed together and then it will turn into a bond instead of something useful. Okay, so it's very dangerous. So we do need a membrane to se separate the product. And of course, everything running in electrolyte because we're talking about uh, doing water with, uh, with CO2 and with sunlight. And, uh, and another one, the product is gas or liquid product that uh, I mentioned. And for this device, the energy and mass transfer uh, they need to throw the right path on the nanoscale, uh, of course, on the device level. And of course, we need to un understand them first before we design efficient device. And actually, figuring out the, uh, the charge transfer, energy transfer process, actually, AFM can do a really good job. And this already has been um, uh, appro approved it in a lot of solid devices, like a uh, like a photovoltaic or some like a uh, solid state uh, battery, a solid state battery, but for this complicated system, really requires some create uh, create uh, creativity for the implementation of the AFM. And here is uh, actually more detail here. So back in two thousand fifteen, actually I wrote a paper together with uh, professors uh, from uh, from Caltech, and. Um, Pretty much this one, this paper uh, talking about the challenges in solar field research. For example, uh, it's very challenging for AFM because if you want to do the imaging, it needs to be in conductive electrolyte, under illumination, at control electrode potential, with desired current density, consider the effect from temperature and gas product, and etc. Okay. And actually, before 2015, I would say the role of AFM for this area was very limited. Most of the papers just use AFM to study morphology in dry state, I mean in air, it's not in situ. 
But recently, in the past several years, we have seen it moving really fast. And of course, I mean, broker is very active in this area because brokers love to uh, provide solutions to address very challenging applications. And our, um, our, our, our uh, Dimension Icon AFM, the, uh, the Dimension Icon platform is a very good example. For example, um, uh, we have an open stage platform and this open open architecture is allowed you to correlate any additional technique. For example, electrochemical, environmental, photo, photoconductive accessory on this such kind of large stage. And because of this, it enables a wide range of correlated measurement and photo electrochemical studies. And I mean, a very good example is the webinar that get by, uh, by Mike Newlis back in July. And of course, Brook has its unique pick for tapping mode. Um, and this pick for tapping mode is very good for sample that not amenable to any other AFM modes because it's a, it's an off resonance uh, tapping mode and then you don't need to worry about the uh, high image force uh, and you can also get a lot of um, uh, a lot of other property at the same time. And recently we uh, we we, uh, we present to the um, uh, to uh, to the um, uh, recently, we uh, developed a nano electrical pro, and this is allow allows sub hundred nanometer local electrochemical activity mapping, and also electro uh, electrical SPMs and liquids. And we also has a data queue mode, and this mode is for big data, deep data, and full spectrum characterization. Now, now we're seeing a AFM a data as a cube now as a as, as like a three D uh, data structure now. And then from here, for example, you can see the uh, you can see the uh, the moving of the effective junction. Uh, at different bias for this uh, PN uh, for this uh, IGBT devices, okay. And uh, of course, um, uh, we have a lot of uh, advanced um, outside the broker, and then uh, and a lot of a lot of them actually our collaborator. Uh, we tried our best to um, we we try our help to support them. Of course, they also support us on a lot of application development. And then, uh, and this is a, a this slide is some example, and all this publication is actually uh, from the speaker in this webinar series, and the highlight this one is actually from a uh, professor fan, professor fan today, and you can see that uh, you, uh, after two thousand fifteen, there's a lot of uh, decent paper coming out, and you can see that actually, for example, this is an, a very good example about the open stage uh, architecture that you can like a. Uh, uh, leap up the cell, put the light uh, illumination, and this is like the work done by uh, Professor Boucher in University of Oregon, and then um, his student Mike Newis, Dr. Mike Newis, present this work back in July, and and today uh, Professor Fine is going to focus on another one on his technique. It's about like a, uh, it, uh, it's 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 a technique that can do the right imaging of photogenerated trust separation. Okay, on a single crystal level, and of course, uh, in December we are going to have a uh, have another um, another talk from Lawrence Berkeley from uh, Dr. Toma and doc Dr. Joanna about um, uh, Joanna about their setup. You can see that again. This is another example of the uh, uh, additional accessory on our icon platform. Oh, so yeah, this is my section. I hope I can give you a very quick introduction, and now I would like to hand this over. Uh, to Professor Fan for his uh, for his talk, so let me make him as a presenter. Uh, okay, I believe um, Professor Fan, it's your turn. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And actually, it's uh, midnight in China, so I really appreciate that. I see many of my friend. Uh, join attendees. Uh, so today I'm very happy to give uh, you a talk on the um, recent we developed a technique called the surface photovoltage spectroscopy. And this technique is uh, set up on the dimension icon and due to its open architecture as uh, Dr. Huang has uh, mentioned. Uh, so the, the title of my talk today is uh, Surface Imaging of Charge Transfer on Photocatalysis. And my name is Feng Tao Fan from uh, Dunning Institute of Chemical Physics. Uh, so I'd like to uh, start my talk with a uh, very famous quotation by the Wolfgang Pauli. And he used to say that God made the bulk and the surface was invented by the devil. 
So the complex characteristic of surface was due to the simple fact that a solid surface share its border with the external world. So if you uh, look at the structure of uh, silicon uh, 100, uh, and uh, you will see that its ideal structure is uh, 1 plus 1. But if you expose uh, this structure to the uh, ambient pressure and some uh, gas, you will see that the silicon uh, structure, silicon 100, will change to 2 plus 1, or sometimes uh, 4 plus 2. So the surface is a very important place that many important chemical and physics uh, happens. Uh, so as uh, for the uh, catalysis, as Erto has a very uh, gave us a very elegant uh, demo that he found that the uh, carb carbon monoxide uh, oxidation on the platinum surface it is not homogeneous. It happens in a spiral way and propagates uh, from time to time. So the uh, semiconductor physics. So for the uh, small devices, uh, even it looks the uh, same. But if you look at the surface potentials, you will see that it uh, totally changed. Uh, it gave you a very beautiful patterns. So the surface is al also important in the semiconductor physics. Uh, so now let's uh, shift to our today's topic. Uh, as uh, Dr. Huang has uh, also mentioned the importance of the solar fuel production via the artificial photosynthesis. So a uh, semiconductor uh, to produce the uh, solar fuel, it will absorb the light to produce the hydrogen and uh, uh, to produce electron and the uh, holes. The water will react with the holes to produce the uh, protons and proton will reduce, uh, react with the uh, electron to produce the hydrogen and sometimes it will produce the, uh, the, the, the methane. Uh, so you will see that in this processes, the most of the element surface uh, will involve the surface charges. So to detect the charges on the photocatalyst is a very important issue in this area. So if you are a little bit familiar with the catalysis, uh, you will realize that the ability of, for the catalysis to transfer the uh, sunlight to the fuel is very huge. The TOF uh, is sometimes always is very big. The problem in this uh, uh, system is that the catalyst, they are always hungry and, and the, the bottleneck is the uh, surface charges. So we have to find some, uh, uh, some method to direct probe the charges on the surface. That's the key challenge in this field. Uh, another feature uh, in this uh, field is that uh, during the last two decades, scientists are tried to fabricate the photocatalyst at the nano to micrometer levels, and they believe that and this uh, architecture, these small, small features, were favors for the charge separation. So another key feature in this system is that the surface charges they are uh, very spatially heterogeneous, and we should uh, use some um, imaging method to see the, the charges. And uh, one of the uh, good uh, uh, challenge in, in the in a charge uh, charge imaging is that uh, the surface charges in the photocatalysis is very low. It always dominate the productivity, the performance of the device of the photocatalyst. Another feature for the surface charge is that the lifetime of this charge is spent from the femtosecond to the second. It spends for about twelve to 15 time scales, so it's very challenging to see these charges. Uh, one of the uh, important approach to see the surface charges in semiconductor uh, physics is the surface photovoltage, and this method is first reported by a uh, American scientist, uh, Professor Breton. Uh, so in his paper uh, published in uh, 1947, and he mentioned that he uh, he see a very interesting phenomenon. The contact potential they change due to the light exposure. So for the n-type and p-type silicon, the contact potential change to an opposite way. So he after I think after maybe uh, five to four years, he explained this phenomenon uh, used the very famous band bending uh, series. And uh, during his uh, uh, Nobel uh, lectures in the 
1956, he said that the surface property of a semiconductor is very important. So the detection of this surface property is 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 very important. So what is the uh, surface photovoltaic approach? So I uh, I will not uh, take too much the uh, talk too much detail. I just give you a cartoon uh, in this uh, slide. And you see that for n-type semiconductor, it will have a up volt band bending. So this band bending will change the surface work function. Uh, it's quite different from the bulk uh, work function. So upper light irradiation, the band bending will tends to recover to his original state. And this uh, processes will yield uh, SPV signals. So according to the different types of the material, the SPV signal will uh, show uh, opposite, maybe positive and negative signals. So according to the definition of the SPV, SPV equals to the amount of the charges plus the distance they separated. And you can see uh, from this cartoon that they, uh, some amount of the electron and how they separate in space. So SPV can give you a, a valuable information. It can tell you the strength of the driving force. It can uh, tell you the charge separation directions and it can uh, give you the charge density. You can calculate it. The problem in this technique is that uh, this technique do not have any spatial resolutions. So that during the last five to uh, six years, our group have developed this uh, because spatially resolved surface photovoltaic spectroscopy. So this technique can detect a uh, real photocatalyst and it, it can show you the uh, work function contra contractness upon light irradiation on a, a single photocatalyst. So here uh, uh, show our uh, uh, the structure of the system. We set up it on the dimension icon. As you can see that we, uh, we use this Uh, we, we, we use a, a monochromator and uh, some uh, op optical structure. We uh, use a modulated light to irritate uh, the sample holder. You see that uh, we can change the uh, colors of light uh, in a modulated way. And this process will uh, give you uh, surface potential signal changes upon irritation of the semiconductor. And you see that for uh, uh, whole signal and electron signal, it will give a totally opposite uh, contact potential changes. So this process is where you uh, two spectra. Uh, one spectra is the uh, uh, phase spectroscopy. So in this uh, in this spectroscopy, and you will see that uh, the 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 positive signal will indicate that that's the photo generated holes on the surface, and the negative signal indicates that it is a photo generated electrons on the surface. And another spectroscopy is the amplitude, amplitude spectroscopy. And this spectroscopy tells you the relative amount of charge carriers on the surface. And furthermore, if you change the colors of the uh, light excita excitations, you will got a spectrum. And this spectrum tells you the de detailed uh, elect uh, elect electronic structures of the uh, semiconductors. Uh, so uh, in the following slide, I will show uh, show you that how we use this technique to uh, to understand the charge separation on a photocatalyst. So our group have perversely uh, found that if you form a phase junction on the surface of a semiconductor, so something like the root and anatized uh, structure on the surface, and for the gallium oxide, uh, you can form the alpha beta phase junction on the surface. If you have this kind of mixed phase on the surface, you'll see that the photocatalytic performance is, is greatly enhanced. So we proposed an uh, idea that it might be possible this structure can favor for the charge separations. So however, at that, that time, we do not have a direct evidence for the charge separation, and we do not understand what is the driving force for the charge separation at the interface. So now you have this uh, technique, you will see that we fabricate this electrode with the rutile nanorode and the anatized nanoparticle layers. You see that if you move the probes into the different layers, 
uh, we detect the electron signal uh, at the anatized nanoparticles and the whole signal at the root high nano root. So this method direct tells you that upon light irradiation and the, the phase junction, they can separate electron and the holes. So the electron is moves from the root high to anatize. So this is a very uh, powerful technique that uh, no other technique can directly give you this kind of information. So furthermore, you have a carrying probe. You can scan the uh, interface. You see that the, the uh, contact potential di uh, di di differences changes from root high to anatize, and we can fit uh, the signal. It gives you the strength of the electrical field. It is about one kV per centimeter. So that's the reason why this phase junction, they can separate the electron and holes. So now uh, this uh, method has been successfully applied to other photoelectrodes in our group. I just uh, uh, show you uh, uh, two literature you can you can read, but I will not show uh, too much detail in in this uh, in this kind of material, uh, because the photo uh, PEC electrode naturally have this asymmetric structure. It can uh, separate the electron holes uh, up on the bias uh, applied. Uh, so uh, the topic today is that if you have this photocatalyst and this structure have this finite structures, the formation of this uh, finite structures, something like the particle, it will uh, form this very famous U shape of band bending uh, in the semiconductor physics. If you have this U shape band bending, uh, something like the 0.37 eV, so it will totally broke the transfer of electron from back to the surface for n-type semiconductor. So according to a calculation, you'll see that the amount of the holes on the surface is at least two order of magnitude more than the electrons. So this is not good for photocatalysis because in photocatalysis, we have to, uh, we are trying to uh, utilize the equivalent amount of electron and holes. So we should find some ways to break the symmetries. So uh, about uh, I think about the five uh, five years ago, our group have found that on a monoclinic uh, single crystal like the bitterness vanadi oxide, we found that upon light irradiation, the photo reduction happens on the top facet, that is the uh, zero one zero facet, and the photo oxidation happens. At the side facet, at the, that is uh, zero one one facet. So it seems that the charge separation can happen at the two facet. So, however, uh, many people are challenged this uh, experiment. They are trying to find evidence, other evidences. Uh, one of the uh, professor uh, Guido Mu in Twente Univers University in Netherlands, he uh, found that it might be possible that the preferentially absorption of these chemical probes might be a reason why you see this phenomenon. So we are trying to uh, figure out whether uh, his answer is right or, or wrong. Another uh, question we want to figure out is that uh, what is the driving force for the charge separation at this micrometer level uh, particles? So now with this technique, we have the opportunity we first uh, synthesize this uh, single crystal. It uh, synthesizes on the conductive substrate. So you see that we got a very beautiful uh, uh, potential image. You, uh, the different facets have the different uh, surface potentials. And upon light irradiation, the surface potential goes up. So if you are familiar with this band bending series, you will realize that the photo generated holes the photogenerated charges, they are accumulate on the surface. That's the reason why it changed the, the surface work function. So uh, now we change the excitation light to a modulate one. We see clearly see the uh, strips on the structure. You see that the, the surface potential is also tuned due to the uh, modulation of the light. So this signal is fed out to a lock-in amplifier and, and it gives you two spectra, and one is the phase one, another is the amplitude one. You see that from the phase signal, uh, the signal indicates that it is the, both of the facets have the signal of the photogenerated holes upon light irradiation. For the amplitude one, you see that the relative amount of the holes on the side facet is 
larger than the top facet. So furthermore, we found that if you can change the shape of this crystal to a thinner one, you see that the surface po uh, photovoltaic uh, differences will be increased up to 70 times uh, on these single crystals. So this technique directly tells you that for uh, uh, single crystal semiconductors, the strength of the built-in electrical field is quite different. So sometimes it can uh, can be uh, increased to 70 times. That's the reason why you see the, the anisotropic charge separations. So actually at, at that time, uh, we, are, we do not understand why you make the thinner particles, the FPV signal is uh, quite uh, quite big. Uh, they can increase up to 70 times. And after uh, two or three years understanding, we now we can use the uh, two-dimensional simulations of the built-in electrical field. And here shows the result. You see that for bare crystals, and uh, they have two opposite built-in electrical field uh, on the surface, and they are not connected with each other. If you make uh, thinner particles, the two opposite built-in electrical fields on the upper and the bottom facet will cancel with, with each other, and this uh, it will give you uh, uh, almost zero SPV signals. And on the corner, and the addition of this vector of the built-in electrical field will give uh, very strong signals. So this uh, simulation very beautifully explain why on some thinner particles, the surface photovoltaic difference is quite different. So that further explains on these structures, the photogenerated holes, they are strongly accumulated on the side facet. So this uh, understanding is very important for the design of the semiconductor uh, crystals. Uh, so this technique, uh, it can give you the image of the chart carrier if you make a subtraction of the surface potential in a dark and under irradiation. And you see that on the n-type semiconductor, the surface is dominated uh, by the holes. And for the p-type 1, the surface is dominated by the electrons. The differences on the different facets is the, is the amount of the charge carriers. So it's something like playing a seesaw on the two facets. The types of the charge carriers, they are now changed. They are the same. The difference is, is only the amount. I have mentioned that the photocatalysis, we are trying to both extract the electron and the holes. So we have to find some way to further break this symmetry. In photocatalyst, most of the system requires the use of the co-catalyst. And people believe that the using of the co-catalyst is to accelerate the surface kinetics. So if you look at the structure of the co-catalyst, you will see that the co-catalyst naturally forms this interface between the co-catalyst and the semiconductor. And there are several questions. The first one is, and what is the exact function of a co-catalyst? Another one is, will the co-catalyst be a spectator or sometimes even against the charge separation in these systems? So now they are trying to figure out this, what happens on this uh, micro to nanometer sized crystals. So again, we start with this model system, and this time we deposited uh, manganese oxide. Uh, it's a very famous uh, oxygen evolution uh, catalyst. It is deposited on the side facet. It is quite interesting to see that if you deposit the co-catalyst on the side facet, the signal of the host is greatly enhanced. Another interesting phenomenon is that there is nothing deposited on the top facet. The signal is also increased, but it changed inside. And this experiment clearly demonstrated that if you add some co-catalyst in these systems, the photogenerated hole and the electron, they can be simultaneously extract to a surface. So it's very important to photocatalysis. So furthermore, we, we see that if you increase the particle sizes, the surface photovoltage on the side facet is greatly enhanced. And at the same time, you see that the photocatalytic performance is, is also increased. So this uh, experiment also clearly demonstrated that the co-catalyst has a very strong function on the uh, built-in electrical field uh, alignment. Uh, that's the reason why it, uh, the photocatalytic performance is uh, greatly enhanced. 
So you, you may remember that a very interesting phenomenon on the top facet is that the uh, photo-generated carriers, they are changed in type from the holes to a very a large amount of electrons. So we are trying to uh, figure out what happens on this system, but it's rather complex. I will, uh, I will not uh, want to take too much time to explain it. I just show you a simulation result. So you see that this is the simulation result for beer crystal and what happens after you deposit a coke catalyst. You see that for beer crystal, the two facets have the opposite built-in electrical field, and they are not connected with each other. If you deposit the coke catalyst, the work function differences between the two uh, system. It will uh, try to move the electrons from the semiconductor to a coke catalyst. And this processes significantly increase the thickness of the surface charge regions from one facet to another facet. So you now you see that the whole crystal they are in a one strong built-in electrical field. That's the reason why you can achieve both electron and hole extraction. So uh, furthermore, we found that if you separate uh, another co-catalyst, something like the uh, hydrogen erosion. Uh, reaction co the uh, surface uh, photovoltaic can be greatly enhanced. And the most interesting thing is that you can use SPV image. You, know, you, you see that the photogenerated holes and the photogenerated electrons, they are uh, distinctly separated along the border of the co catalyst depositions. So we measured the, the strength of the built in electrical field, and we got a very strong. Uh, uh, result, you see that the uh, uh, strength can be up to 2.5 kV per centimeter, so it's almost the same as the PN junction. So that's the reason why we, uh, why you, ha you have uh, this very uh, good photo charge uh, separation efficiency. So with the SPV uh, method, you can uh, give your uh, quantitative result to explain what happens on the catalyst and, uh, and after the cold catalyst deposition. So i give you a cartoon or summarize this result. You see that for beer crystal, it have a two opposite built-in electrical field. They are not connected with, with each other. If you randomly add the cold catalyst and uh, the, the, uh, the strength of a vector is uh, increased, but the net result is not increased. If you put the cold catalyst in a certain regions, you see that it can uh, align the built-in electrical field and you can get a very strong uh, vectors of built-in electrical field. So I just uh, uh, give you a take-home message that the coal catalyst should be placed in the right place. Uh, so in this situation, the two vectors on the uh, different areas, they will cooperate with each other to give you a very strong uh, signals. So that's a very important uh, knowledge uh, when you are designing a photo uh, catalyst. Uh, so uh, I gave a, gave a, a first uh, brief uh, summary here. Uh, we start from the PEC electrode. You see that uh, this structure naturally have this asymmetric band bending. It helps for the charge separation. If you have a photocatalyst, it have this uh, U-shape symmetric uh, electrical field. And if you can um, make a uh, in equivalent facet, you see that the symmetry is further break and you can break the band bending alignment. And if you would deposit the co catalyst, it totally aligns the, the electrical field to the uh, polarized uh, structure. You can achieve the uh, uh, charge separations. Uh, so uh, people may ask uh, me uh, questions that uh, for most of the photocatalysts, there's no uh, this uh, anisotropic structure such as this uh, inequivalent facet but it also can perform the photocatalysis. So they're asking what else we can do. Uh, can we use other methods to break these symmetries? So actually, if you uh, look at the object at the sunset and the sunrise, you will see that it naturally forms this illuminate facet and the shadow facet. So actually, this kind of symmetry breakings. And another very important effect in physics is the photo damper effect. So it claims that if you have a very strong laser to hit uh, one of the localized uh, uh, surface, you will see that the electron it moves faster than the hose for most of the material. The mobility is quite large, more than the hose. 
so it naturally form this separated electron holes. So that's kind of the the charge separations. So the problem is that uh, whether this phenomenon also happens on the photocatalyst, and how strong is this strong force, and can we utilize it to perform the photocatalysis? And recently, we uh, fabricate our system to a uh, two light source excitation systems, and we found a very interesting uh, phenomenon. If you have this uh, symmetric uh, excitation, and this is a simulation of the real uh, photocatalytic conditions, so you are you have the scattering light. You see that the the surface of the photocatalyst is dominated by the photogenerated holes. So, ha however, if you uh, lower the, the symmetry of this illumination, you see that the electron holes it can be separate uh, between the illuminated facet and the shadow facet. So the re result turns out that uh, upper light irradiations, the holes ac accumulate on the illuminated facet and the electron accumulate on the shadow facet. Uh, you can clearly see the result from the SPV uh, signal and the phase signals. So this uh, phenomenon is very interesting. It can help you to control the happening of the chemical uh, reactions. We use this method to selectively deposit the gold through the uh, photoreduction on the shadow facet, and we deposit the magnetic oxide through the photooxidation on the illuminate facet. So it this asymmetric deposition further increase the strength of the built-in electrical field, and this uh, again leads to the uh, highly increase of the photocatalytic performances and due to the increase of the uh, built-in electrical field. And furthermore, we, uh, we increase the particle sizes uh, from the uh, nanometer to the micro size, and we see that uh, this diffusion force is greatly uh, increased and it can uh, reach up to uh, 15 millivolt. So th this is even bigger than the intrinsic built-in electrical field. So another finding is that through the fitting results, we see that the mobility of the electron is at least two orders of magnitude more than the holes. So that's the reason why you see this uh, diffusion forces. So this understanding can help you to design a good photocatalyst and a photo Electrochemical uh, PEC electrode uh, by you are fabricating this kind of system. Uh, we call it a diffusion uh, force. Uh, so in a, in in the uh, last part of this uh, section, uh, I will show our recent unpublished result on um, another strategy to break this symmetry. We utilize the defects. We control the location of the defects. So we start uh, from this cupric oxide uh, because this system they have the different kind of the, the trap states. So the, the intrinsic uh, trap state is a whole trap. A whole trap. So that's the reason why uh, most of the cupric oxide it shows the p-type uh, response. But sometimes you can make uh, artificial defects. Uh, you, if you add the proton to the vacancies, it will form the electron traps. So now you have uh, two kind of traps. So it's very interesting uh, to see that if you can train the distribution of the uh, defects on the surface uh, as monitored by the uh, XPS uh, result, you'll see that the SPV signal can be totally tuned if you tune the net uh, density of the uh, electron and hole traps. Uh, from the SPV imaging, you'll see that the surface chart carrier tab, they, they change from the holes to the electron, so it's fully, uh, fully tunable uh, on the single particle levels. And from the transient SPV signal, we detect that if you have this uh, uh, artificial defect, that, uh, that is the electron traps, you will have another opposite, uh, uh, opposite separation processes. So that's the reason why you see that the uh, surface charges on the surface are changed from the holes to the electrons. Uh, so another benefit of the uh, uh, atomic force microscopy is that you can use the diamond to make a scratch on the crystal. You see that with increasing the depth, we see that the types of the uh, chart carrier, they change from the holes to the electrons. So uh, this result indicates that the reason why the uh, photogenerated carriers tra uh, carrier change from the electron to the holes, it is because of it have the uh, coating of this n-type layer on the surface. 
So this understanding is very important because people in photocatalysis they, they always believe the defects can uh, is uh, very harmful for the charge separation. But our finding is that if you can control the defect locations, it can control the charge separations. So another important knowledge from this understanding uh, recently is that we can control the deposition of the defects on a different uh, facet. You see that we can totally change uh, the charge carrier property to from two electron facet to one electron facet, one whole facet, and one and to the two uh, whole facet. So I just show that with this understanding of the de uh, defects locations, you can totally change the properties of these semiconductor uh, particles. Uh, so uh, here I give you another uh, summary that uh, the how we can uh, utilize the symmetry breaking rules. So we start from this uh, symmetry crystals. So if you have the an isotropic structure, uh, something like this, uh, an uh, inequivalent facet, it can slightly increase the strength of the driving force. So if you have the asymmetric light radiation on the system, it will also further increase the strength of the driving force. In the last part, I show you uh, show that if you can manipulate the defects on the surface, it, it further breaks the symmetry, and the strength of the driving force is increased uh, according to this order. And furthermore, the most of the important thing in this area is that you can utilize the differences in the uh, in the in the initial material, you can deposit the co-catalyst to a very uh, highly uh, spatial in homogeneous way, and this will greatly uh, break the symmetry and uh, strongly increase the strength of the driving forces that increase the charge separation uh, efficiencies. So that's our uh, recent understanding. We published paper in a review. Uh, if you're interested, you can read this paper. Uh, so in the final part, I will uh, talk about the robot interface uh, by uh, two uh, quick uh, uh, examples. So the surface plasmonic uh, uh, resonance is a very hot topic in photocatalysis because they, this kind of material it, it can tune the absorption uh, light uh, wavelengths. Another important uh, uh, important issue is that uh, this. Uh, kind of material can local uh, can increase the localized electromagnetic field. So the problem in this field is that the lifetime of the charge carrier is quite fast. It's uh, it's below the uh, fifty femtosecond. So you have to find some way to uh, to froze this photo generated holes, hot holes or hot electrons. So there are many key questions in these uh, systems. So one of the questions is the, what is the uh, hot uh, charge uh, separation uh, distribute upon light radiation, and how the localized electromagnetic field affects the hot charge uh, spatial separation? So the final uh, practical question is that how can we get more hot charge uh, at the nano to micrometer uh, fabrications? Uh, our group uh, recently uh, they uh, established a strategy we form. Uh, uh, very efficient chocolate barriers between the gold and the titanium oxide. You see that we can achieve uh, water oxidations in uh, up around the plasmonic excitations. So one of the interesting phenomena we found that if you block in the interface, the photocatalytic performance is also decreased. Uh, de decreased. So we are trying to figure out what happens uh, during these processes. If you use the carrying probe uh, microscope, you see that you can clearly see the cylinder rings uh, uh, along the border of the gold and titanium oxide. Uh, you can use the uh, uh, conduct uh, AFM. Uh, you can measure that uh, the reason why you see this cylinder ring is that it forms the chocolate barrier about uh, 0.82 eV. Uh, so that's a barrier. Uh, it's a change of the band bending uh, due to the formation of a chocolate barrier. Uh, the most important thing is that we detect the whole signals at the uh, at the premiere of this gold and the titanium oxide at the interface. You see that we can give you a, a whole signal according to SPV uh, spectroscopy. Uh, if you want to make an image, you see that most of the photogenerated holes they are at the interface of the gold and the titanium. 
So it uh, agree well with the theoretical simulation of the distribution of the localized electro, uh, electromagnetic field. Uh, so furthermore, if you uh, blocked interface with some uh, silicon oxide, you see that you will now see this kind of whole signal. The experiment clearly uh, tell us that the interface in a plasmonic semiconductor photocatalyst is very important. You have to fabricate a very efficient uh, sufficient chocolate barriers to suppress the, the recombination of the hot, uh, hot charges. So that's one of the understandings. So you see that this technique is very sensitive uh, because people always believe the SPR phenomenon in photocatalysis is very weak, but we can now detect it. And with this advantage, we are now we can detect the more challenge things. We detect the whole signals at the uh, gold dimers and I think everyone knows that if you have a gold dimers close uh, enough, it shudders the uh, local electromagnetic field can be greatly enhanced. But with this method, we can directly see that under this very strong localized electromagnetic field, we clearly detect a very efficient charge separation. So uh, this is uh, at least a order of magnitude more than the single, uh, single gold uh, nanoparticles. So uh, you can use the uh, uh, AFM tip to use the nano man mode in uh, in Brook uh, machines. You can make uh, different gold dimers. You see that you can give you a correlation between the charge separation and also the local electromagnetic field. So this is the first time that we uh, we show that the, uh, the 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 quantity of the charge separation is directly related to the square of the near field enhancement. So that is to say, if you make more hot spot, you will got more uh, photogenerated charger and uh, thus uh, uh, more efficient photocatalysis. Uh, so uh, that's what we have done recently in the uh, nano, uh, uh, nano, uh, nano, nano, nano SPR systems. Uh, so finally, I will give uh, uh, conclusions here. Uh, uh, I think I have convinced you that uh, charge separation in photocatalysis is very important. That's the key issue. And uh, focusing on this, the F AFM tools, uh, in particular the SPV tools, is uh, very powerful to answer the driving force uh, uh, on the photocatalysis. So another uh, knowledge is that breaking the symmetry of photocatalysis is a very important knowledge. You can use this strategy by the inequivalent facet asymmetric light illumination and spe spatially homogeneous distributions. Uh, but I have to mention that all of these me measurements are on ambient pressure and with uh, moisture atmospheres. And the photocatalysis uh, happens on the electrolyte, sometimes in water. And we are trying to, uh, I think we are trying to develop a new tools. Uh, and you, you, are, you, you, may, you may know from the uh, Dr. Huang's uh, slide, uh, he shows that Brook recently developed the scanning electron chemical microscope. And this uh, method is very powerful. We also uh, have take some time. We can, you can see that with this technique, we can truly uh, identify the, the chemical reaction site uh, in the uh, electrolyte. So this will become very powerful uh, in the future. Uh, so uh, at the end, I will uh, give my sincere acknowledgement to Professor Ken Lee and he's a, a big boss of our group. And he suggests this topic to develop the imaging technique. Uh, and also, uh, I'd like to thank these students. Uh, they are doing an excellent job. And thank you for your attention. Um, thank you also uh, from uh, my side um, to all the participants for your attention. Um, give me just a second to uh, uh, get a hold of your questions here. And we'll, uh, we'll go through the, uh, the, the questions you've uh, submitted. Um, okay. If you haven't submitted one yet, you can uh, do so in the, in the questions dialog box. So let's see. Um, I see a number of you have uh, uh, um, asked about the um, the um, SPV um, images and uh, graphs. Uh, Professor Fan, you you've shown a lot of uh, beautiful um, SPV images and uh, data. Um, participants are asking, uh, can you speak about the spatial resolution and the energy resolution you you obtain with uh, SPV? Okay, uh, so that's very important for this technique. Uh, the spatial resolution is uh, based on the tip geometries. 
and the uh, it's based on the Karen probe for the microscopy. Uh, so the uh, so so the current resolution is about uh, thirty uh, nanometers. So we are trying to develop more uh, other method to increase this uh, spatial resolution. So our uh, best result is that it can increase to about 10 nanometers with the localized uh, enhancement of absorbers. So that's, uh, that's one of the answer. So another uh, uh, question is about the energy resolution. So I think it's uh, based on the Karen probe. The Karen probe energy resolution is about uh, f uh, 5 millivolts. But actually, if you use the locking amplifier, and we do not have a, a very clear date, but uh, we think that that's better than the four millivolts. It's sometimes sometimes it can reach uh, up to uh, one or two millivolts. That's better than the current pro because we have a locking amplifier. So that's my answer about these two issues. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we had a question uh, early on in the um, uh, presentation was submitted early on uh, when you were talking about amplitude and phase and uh, the participant wanted to know, could you explain once more um, what was the information specifically you get from the phase as opposed to the amplitude of the signal? Okay. Uh, so okay. So can you can see my desk? Uh, so, so okay. I will um, explain in more detail about uh, what we obtained uh, in the. Wait a moment. So, so you see that if you uh, collect the CPD changes upon light irradiation, it will give the different uh, trends. So in the. Uh, Sometimes in the uh, uh, n-type semiconductor, the surface potential I have shown that it will uh, it will uh, it will change to to the opposite directions. If you have p-type one, it will give you totally different directions. So that is uh, you can use the the phase signal uh, because the phase signal uh, gave you the explanation. Uh, what is the uh, 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 phase lag between the excited signal and here I show in the yellow uh, curves and uh, if that's uh, same uh, in the same region uh, let's say it's uh, in the positive region that's the whole signal if that's totally opposite uh, to the uh, excitation signal uh, signal that's the uh, uh, whole signal uh, so what the amplitude tell us is that uh, you see that the, I have mentioned the SPV equals to the uh, quantity of the charges plus the distances. So uh, from the amplitude, you can know the amount of the photogenerated charges on the surface. Uh, uh, that that uh, if you you can if you can simulate and calculate it, will give you the exact amount of the photogenerated charges on the surface. So that's the the two uh, answers to to the phase and the amplitude. Uh, spectroscopy. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and uh, we had another question. Um, this one was specific to slide uh, twelve. Um, um, how do you image the cross section in slide twelve? Okay, uh, so I think it's uh, titanium mixed phase. Yeah. Uh, 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 this uh, interface is made by uh, uh, argon M beam. Uh, we uh, use this M beam to smooth this surface, and uh, you can scan from the surface uh, substrate to the anatized direction. You can direct uh, uh, load the tips on the interface. That will, that will give you an image of the surface potential. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, another question. Um, <clears throat> Could you say more about um, uh, if this method could be a uh, time resolved in the future? Yeah, uh, that's a, a good question. Uh, so uh, actually, uh, this technique, the the temporal resolution, is uh, limited by the uh, current loop. Uh, I think uh, if you if you understand the, the working principle of the current loop, 
uh, your mostly the time constant is 10 milliseconds to get one signal of the surface potential. So that is uh, uh, the SPV is also limited by the time uh, uh, time resolution of the uh, current probe. Uh, so what they are trying to do is that uh, Dr. Huang has shown that uh, recently Brooklyn make a very uh, beautiful the the, the SCM CM tip with a very uh, tiny exposed conductive errors. So this tick has a very fast time uh, time constant response. Uh, so this where um, in the future become a very important tools in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, in fact, I see there has been a, another question um, uh, regarding that, and you had mentioned uh, uh, earlier on the the um, you know Parando SECM. Uh, maybe Teddy, this is a question for you. Um, uh, can you run electrical measurements in uh, liquid in in liquid electrolyte that's uh, conductive? <clears throat> yeah, this is a good question. And then uh, back in July uh, on the webinar and our other several webinars, we actually talked about this in detail. And especially in the July webinar, uh, I showed you um, uh, the challenge for image uh, for do nano electrical measurement in liquid. Of course, you need to worry about you need to worry about several things, right? So if you just uh, let's say use a uh, use uncoated metal probe, then you are going to have a lot of problem with that. For example, a leakage current, capacitive charge, uh, everything, and also diffuse, uh, diffuse electric field in the, in, the, in the liquid. And another one, um, a professor friend just mentioned, if you don't insulate the probe, you are exposed a lot of uh, metal area, and then you are, uh, the, the metal and electrolyte going to form a electrical double layer, which has a huge capacitance there, and then it also will mess up the, uh, um, and it will cause a lot of delay for any AC technique. So long story short, with the uh, SECM probe with the variable, yes, we can do nano electrical measurement in liquid, and then we have a lot of example. I would encourage you to go uh, to check out our webinar in the past, and then uh, any webinar talking about nano electrical uh, uh, measurement in liquid or SECM, all have this kind of information. Thank you, thank you, Teddy. Um, and uh, I think we have another question here for Professor Fan. Um, it says, can you comment on the, the, trap, the trap density quantification and uh, recombination assay by SPV? Yeah, uh, that's also uh, good uh, questions. So actually what SPV show uh, you is the steady state distribution of the photogenerated carriers. So it's a result of the separation and the recombination. It's a net result. And uh, 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 currently, we cannot give uh, you a direct uh, uh, answer of the, uh, the ex exact recombination rate. But according to the uh, SPV, uh, the, tra the traditional SPV experiment, you can uh, measure recombination rates if you can uh, you, you can log uh, gradually increase the intensity of the uh, laser, laser uh, light intensity it you, you can solve the function uh, it will give you a time constant of this kind of the chart carriers ah, okay. Th thank you um another question here uh, i think also for professor fan uh, more to the uh, to the setup that you built um why did you choose this specific instrument, the uh, dimension icon, to uh, create this SPV spectroscopy? Okay, uh, and uh, as this question is something like a uh, advertisement of broker, <laughs> uh, but uh, I I have to say that the uh, the icon dimension icon it has a very good advantage of this uh, open architecture. Uh, and I show in this video that you see that you can uh, f you can fabricate you can install uh, many optical uh, elements on this uh, stage and uh, on the on the stage neighboring the uh, AFM uh, the machines. So this is the most advantageous things of uh, icon uh, dimension icon more than other uh, atomic force microscopy. Uh, I, I have we have seen many uh, uh, microscopy, but most of them the space is very tiny. Uh, it uh, do not uh, uh, give you the space to operate uh, to and to uh, to further develop uh, this kind of system. Thank you. Yeah. Um, now I, we have another question, more uh, to the uh, scientific uh, question. Can you say more about the relationship between the uh, the built-in electric field and the particle thickness? 
uh, yeah, uh, according to the, the principle of the SPV, uh, SPV equals to the amount of charges plus the distance. Uh, if you increase, in principle, if you increase the particle thicknesses, the built-in, the strength of built-in electrical field uh, will be increased. Uh, so that's a, a simple uh, logic, but uh, actually it's, uh, it's often depends on the doping density and other uh, situations. Okay, thank you. Um, see, we're, um, uh, we've spent a lot of time. Um, I'll, um, uh, let's have a one, a one more question. Um, could you uh, uh, say more about the kind of information that can be obtained um, for this case of the uh, gold dimers, um, about the hotspot, um, when you have gold dimers on a, um, a, a titanium dioxide surface? Uh, yeah, um, uh, so actually uh, in the literature, people, there are many techniques to image what happens uh, on these uh, hot, uh, hot, spot, uh, hot spots. Uh, most of the result is that it can, they can detect uh, the uh, distribution of the electromagnetic field but uh, no other uh, very uh, powerful method they can direct give you a charge separation uh, uh, quantity uh, and the SPV can give you this kind of information so that's the uh, exact information they are trying to know in photocatalysis so uh, the, the result uh, clearly give you the result of a charge separation density okay um, thank you very much um, so we're at uh, 10 minutes past the hour, so we'll conclude this session now. We do have more questions and uh, we'll follow up by email. I um, okay. want to thank um, uh, the, both of the speakers again, Professor Fan as well as uh, Dr. Huang today. And uh, thank you to the audience for uh, joining us. Um, if on the way out you do uh, have a moment to answer our survey, we'd very much appreciate it. And uh, thank you and until next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.